is the season when, according to the carols and lore, Santa makes his list, checks it twice, and finds out who's been naughty and nice. Whether we have been naughty or nice, of course, determines what fills our stockings, presents or coal. It makes for a fun holiday song, but me, I'm not concerned about whether you or I have been naughty or nice. I'm wondering if you have been kind, if you've been generous, honest, compassionate. Our society places a lot of value on niceness, but niceness, I've realized, doesn't always serve us well, nor is nice synonymous with good, as the song suggests. I read an article recently by an author named Alison Vesterfelt on why she decided to quit being nice. Yeah, sounds interesting. It caught my attention. When she graduated high school, she was described by her classmates as the nicest person I know and was told to never change. At the time, it felt like the highest compliment she could get, and she made a commitment to never change, to be nice forever. Ten years later, she heard from a former classmate with whom she'd reconnected at a funeral. The former class classmate reminded her of a time during their sophomore year in high school in which Allison had been walking up the stairs with some friends and a girl in front of them tripped. Her friends laughed and made fun of the girl and Allison stood back, eyes wide and mouth shut. She didn't say anything to the girl or to her friends. I was that girl, said the woman at the funeral. But Allison had no recollection of this incident and she felt panicked at the time, wanting to remember it so that she could explain why she had done such a thing. I was the nice girl. Why would the nice girl do something like that, she thought. And in that moment, Allison had the painful realization that niceness is not everything. And so she decided to quit being the nice girl. These sorts of incidents happen all the time in our lives, in school hallways, on the streets, in families, and in churches. Niceness is never saying a bad word about anyone else and never giving anyone else reason to say a bad word about us. This is not inherently wrong. Being nice and polite is entirely appropriate in many situations. Niceness can be driven by the need for self-protection. If I am nice, people are less likely to reject me. I think we're all partly motivated by this, but an especially vulnerable or sensitive person is sometimes more inclined to be nice. Have you ever joined a new community or started at a new school or a new job, most people in that situation will be very nice to others. And quite understandably, we want to fit in and be accepted. The problem is that niceness sometimes gets in the way of saying what we truly think. And it can, can prevent us from having really authentic, meaningful relationships with people once we settle into that new community or school or job. The word nice is derived from a Latin word meaning ignorant and a French word meaning not to know. The link between these derivatives and the current use of niceness seems to be silence. <coughs> In order to avoid confrontation or offending people with our honest opinion, we might communicate indirectly or even not at all. Many of us do this, myself included, I caught myself recently um, with an, I had occasion to confront someone. I saw her treating others disrespectfully and she seemed really overwhelmed and stressed and seemed to be taking that out on others. So I talked to her about it. I told her about the behavior that I've witnessed, but in a nice way, saying, I know you must be really tired and stressed and, and I offered support. I didn't want her to get mad at me, but I was troubled by her behavior, so I felt the need to speak up. 
Unfortunately, my niceness ended up overshadowing the challenge that I had intended, and she seemed to walk away from our conversation thinking, how nice of her to offer support. In order to avoid conflict, we might also not communicate at all. For example, common, ex common example, when we're served something wrong in a restaurant or the food isn't very good, and we might eat it anyway. Or like Alice and Vesterfeld, we don't say anything for fear of being rejected by those close to us. This keeps us from sometimes expressing theological or political opinions in certain settings, or from speaking up when we feel strongly, when something, or when something offends us. How many of you were told by families or teachers that if you couldn't say anything nice, don't say anything at all? Yeah, sounds familiar. How many of you have ever heard someone say, bless their heart, when actually thinking something else? I know that's common around here. <laughs> We live in a culture with common expressions and niceties that sometimes unfortunately cover for the honesty and the depth of what we're truly thinking and feeling. I chose the poem A Ritual to Read to Each Other by William Stafford as today's reading because I love it and because I think it also expresses some of the dangers of these cultural niceties and of silence. So much of the oppression in this world comes from the fact that we don't know each other in the fullness of our humanity. Stafford writes, a pattern that others made may prevail in the world, and following the wrong God home, we may miss our star. I call it cruel and maybe the root of all cruelty to know what occurs, but not recognize the fact. This is niceness. When we follow the patterns that others have made, the cultural expectations of niceness, and when we see and know what happens but don't acknowledge it or speak up. When we do this, says Stafford, we let the parade of our mutual life get lost in the dark. Instead, let us be awake. Let us regard, really regard one another. Let the light shine out from within us, giving clear signals, saying what we mean with kindness. While Santa may make a list based on niceness and naughtiness, I personally would rather be judged, if I'm going to be judged at all, based on kindness. I don't know any religion that talks about niceness as a value or a virtue, but religions around the world do promote kindness. Religious leaders, saints, and prophets are not remembered for being nice, but they're lifted up for their honesty, for their prophetic voice, their authenticity, and the love that they show towards others, their kindness. Given the nice culture that we live in, the kindness of religion could almost be seen as countercultural. I think that sometimes when we are nice, what we're actually aiming for is kindness. But niceness isn't always kind. As Alison Vesterfeld concludes from her experience, she writes, niceness stays quiet. Kindness speaks up. Niceness lies to keep the peace. Kindness knows that the only way to make peace is to tell the truth. Niceness holds back. Kindness moves forward with humility, gentleness, and grace. I would also add, niceness is polite and kindness is compassionate. Kindness moves us to say what's on our mind, sometimes really hard things, while preserving both our own dignity and the dignity of others. Rather than diminishing or dismissing what we really think or feel, with kindness we regard our own intuitions and thoughts and feelings with respect and seek to communicate them out of the goodness of our heart with the goal of respecting others as well. While religions don't explicitly support niceness, they sometimes do in practice. Unitarian Universalists have had our own share of struggles around this. We are called, of course, to kindness, kindness to ourselves and to others and to the world. 
But in, 2000, uh, in the 2005 Unitarian, Universal, Unitarian Universalist Association report on engaging our theological diversity, one of our theologians and seminary presidents, Rebecca Parker, said that growing theological diversity within the UU culture, where tolerance and acceptance are considered paramount values, commonly makes individuals so afraid of offending one another that conversation about belief and theology is stifled, creating what she calls a UU culture of niceness. Now, my experience in Unitarian Universalist churches over the past eight years since this report was published is that things are changing. And my experience of this church is that you do engage in such conversations, though they're sometimes difficult, and that you're learning from one another and growing spiritually as a result of engaging across difference. But I know that for some, there's still that underlying fear Values of tolerance and acceptance, which we hold up, can reinforce niceness, holding some things back, rather than kindness. And these values are used to back up, I think, the idea that some Unitarian Universalists have that we can believe whatever we want, rather than confidently claiming what we do believe and value. One thing that holds us together as Unitarian Universalists is covenant expressed in the affirmation that this church says every Sunday. And the thing about covenant is that it calls us to be more than nice. Our covenant speaks to how we regard ourselves in connection with others and the divine. And it's an expression of our interdependence, the ways in which we're connected. It also calls us to accountability. And niceness doesn't create accountability, but kindness can. Authentic, honest, relationship-building kindness. Kindness is another word for the loving doctrine of this church, with which we dwell together in peace, seek knowledge and freedom, and serve humanity in fellowship. Niceness, I've noticed, tends to operate on the surface level, whereas kindness and compassion go deeper. This week as I was looking into this, I found a lot of root words that seemed to bring a lot of meaning to this. Another French word, regarder, means to look again or to look at deeply. When we look again at something or someone, we move beyond a sort of first glance judgment. We see more fully and truthfully with more compassionate regard and with kindness. So as I sit here at the edge of 2013 and the cusp of 2014, I encourage us all to reflect on our regard for one another and how this calls us to act and to be with one another. How do we regard ourselves? How do we regard each other? How do we regard the ups and the downs of this past year? And when you're looking back at 2014, what do you wish to see? Will it be a naughty or a nice year or a year of kindness? What will your New Year's resolutions be? And will you be kind with yourself if you fall short of your expectations? You've probably heard Daniel or Aaron say that when a minister preaches, they're often preaching not just to the congregation, but to themselves. And this is one of those sermons. In this new year, one of my resolutions is to approach myself and others, not just with niceness, but with kindness, true kindness. To make peace through speaking truth with as much humility, gentleness, and grace as I can. I invite you to join me.